Hey, everybody. Welcome to yet another Journal Club brought to you by Lifespan.io. I'm Oliver Medvedic, along with all my compatriots here, and uh, we will be presenting uh, a novel techniques paper here. Um, I don't know if we've, uh, uh, Steve, ever done a, um, a CRISPR paper, have we? Have we done a CRISPR Cas9 paper in the past and focusing on CRISPR? Uh, many moons ago, we, we have, but I mean, many moons ago, like a couple of years ago, we did um, one. Couldn't tell you which one it was, but we definitely touched upon it. Yeah, okay, so we touched upon it. So this one is is, is going to be really, um, uh, the cool thing about this paper is it's, 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 it's very thorough. It's, uh, it's a novel, uh, novel CRISPR fusion protein. Um, and uh, they actually made a key scientific discovery in this paper. And it's a techniques paper in that it's, you know, they really, really proved the kind of uh, the usefulness of this technique. And I think what everybody will appreciate here, or most people are looking forward to using it here, is, is seeing how it could, might have an effect on aging and aged cells, particularly with respect to, um, uh, to the uh, epigenetic changes that take place in aging cells, particularly the methylation clock, um, the Horvath clock, and other clocks that... Uh, we familiarized you with. Um, so the ability to alter the epigenetic status throughout a genome um, using uh, a modified CRISPR enzyme uh, is the focus of this paper. Uh, so we'll take a look at some of this data. Uh, but before we start, um, so let me just kind of introduce the, the name of the paper and the authors, or at least the, the lead author. And then um, I'll actually jump into a little background in CRISPR itself, because um, that's basically the of, of this paper. Um, so let me uh, let me bring this paper up here. Um, share screen. There we go. So it's a cell paper, genome-wide programmable transcriptional memory by CRISPR-based epigenome editing. So as I've said, Nunez et al. Um, lots of lots of love. So it's a, so that's a summary. That's the highlights and. So we've got uh, UCSF, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, Harvard Medical School, Broad Institute, Stanford, Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, Boston Children's Hospital, UT Southwestern. So a whole bunch of these, uh, these places. Um, and sorry, there's a kind of a gremlin just creeped up on my shoulder here. Uh, so uh, let me, <laughs> that's Bartosz, by the way. Um, he likes my shoulder. So let's uh, share screen here. So I've got some slides here. Hopefully these slides will, um, let me see slide, let me enter slideshow mode. Steve, can you see that? First time I don't usually share slides, so I'll make sure this is good. I can see it, yeah. All right, good. So these are old. So this is when CRISPR first came out. So this is science, nature, seek and destroy, targeted destruction, all very uh, dramatic, um, dramatic uh, advertising for the technology. And this technology, of course, uh, won um, Emmanuel Carpentier and Jennifer Doudna Nobel Prizes in, uh, I believe, last year, 2020, um, for this CRISPR technology, um, which they uh, developed. Um, they kind of honed it into a technology in one of their key papers back in 2012. Uh, so a little bit about this technology. Um, so a little bit about the science. Um, so CRISPR is, um, stands for uh, uh, clustered repetitively interspersed palindromic repeats. So this basically means that there's a repetitive sequences of DNA in bacteria that was discovered long before um, the work that led to the Nobel Prize. Um, in basically bacteria and archaea, so, you know, prokaryotes. Um, and it's basically an antiviral database inside of bacteria. So viruses infect bacteria, bacteriophages, their viral DNA goes in, and there's a copying mechanism that puts this DNA into this, this, uh, these areas that were strange uh, for a long period of time. And then um, over the years, a number of scientists, uh, Bohika, I believe, was one of them, um, uh, speculated and hypothesized that this was a, um, a mechanism for the bacteria to recognize the virus by copying the DNA in using a series of enzymes. Uh, one of the enzymes being Cas9, which is an endonuclease. Um, and this um, DNA that's encoded as in, within the literal antiviral database of the bacteria is then transcribed into RNA 
and the two different RNA bits. Uh, one bit binds to the Cas9, the other bit, which is this purple colored bit, will then recognize uh, the viral DNA if it reinfects, and then this guides the Cas9 and the nuclease um, and other derivatives of the Cases uh, to this uh, DNA and causes it to be cleaved by basically cutting it in two sites. So it's basically a guidance system. Um, so this is really, really, um, really cool and crazy because you know up until then, you know, acquired immunity was 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 figured to be only something found in higher organisms, right? Um, it's still, I, I still, I think it's still with not known if insects have acquired immunity. Certainly, mammals have acquired immunity, right? Um, but uh, but everything else is sort of has innate immunity, um, and it's kind of interesting to kind of give a little bit of a little bit of uh, pedagogy here, a little bit of background. So this is, you know, this this acquired immunity that was discovered in bacteria. I mean, who would have expected that, right? That's nobody. Um, was now co op is now co-opted into a biotechnological tool. And this really, really, really is, is sort of, um, you know, very spookily simi similar, very spookily similar, very, um, uh, very similar to the early technology of restriction endonucleases, right? Which are also an antiviral system um, that was used in early cloning, right? So back phage inserts squirts DNA in, you have a restriction site that's uh, uh, recognized by this Pac-Man, which is a restriction endonuclease, uh, and it cleaves it and it chops it all up. Um, but this is a baked in innate system, this restriction endonuclease, whatever it is, Hindi 3, Eco R1, you've got hundreds of them, maybe thousands. Um, they recognize a discrete sequence and they can't be modified, right? Unless you change the amino acids around or something. Um, so they'll recognize it and chop it up. So this is like the innate immune system. And then it was later co-opted in the 70s to become a, a technique to cut DNA. And now we've got a more sophisticated acquired immune system that was discovered in bacteria throughout the 80s, 90s, and early 2000s. Um, and it's been co-opted to um, guide and program the endonucleases to specific locations. So then... Um, I'm going to skip through this slide, but people have been basically working on these things called programmable endonucleases, which is you can program the endonuclease to recognize the sequence and go into different locations. Um, and that's been done with proteins, zinc finger nucleases, tailins. Um, but now we've got this CRISPR Cas9 and derivatives, which basically you can think of it as two parts the protein part and the RNA part, right? And those two go together like chocolate and peanut butter, right? So um, what makes this whole system really, really, really adaptable is this RNA part, because this RNA part is the only part that's variable that you can, that you change around. So nucleic acids are really easy to change around. Um, proteins are really hard to change around because any changes you make can have structural, ch you know, changes that are not very well predictable. Um, and there's a lot of trial and error. So these are in theory programmable and also in practice, but not very programmable. Versus this, you can crank out many different synthetic um, guide RNAs and combine them with a Cas9 protein. And this red region of the guide RNA is going to target it, it's about 20 nucleotides long, to a complementary region anywhere in a genome uh, within, within uh, certain constraints. So this whole thing comes together, you have a scaffold and a spacer. So the one of the key things that uh, that uh, was done early in uh, the Doudna um, and ERPMDA experiments uh, from 2012 is that they made the system even simpler. The guide RNA is now one single strand instead of two different strands that are found in nature. So it's one one piece of nucleic acid, um, and you basically you don't even need to modify the whole nucleic acid. You just modify the one piece that is specific for um, forming what's known as a heteroduplex, uh, guiding the system to a location um, within the genome. And the rest of this guide RNA is actually a constant region that's um, specific for the different gases that are out there. So you've got this constant region, and then you've got this region, which is really the only region you're changing using software, right? So it really can't get much simpler than that when you're actually designing a system to to guide your system to, um, you know, to different locations. Um, and there's a bunch of other things you have to keep in mind. There's software that helps you. There's something called a protospace or JSON motif we won't go into. Um, but the system, you know, assembles, assembles. Um, you, you basically have this all on plasmids. 
and it guides to a location. And then the original system cuts the DNA. One, there's an endonuclease. Um, it cuts at one strand at one location, another strand at the other, and you get a double-stranded break. So that was the original, um, the original um, uh, you know, use of CRISPR-Cas9 is to cut DNA. And why would you need cut DNA? Well, of course, you need to cut it to splice things in for genetic modification and genetic engineering. Um, so there's different Cas variants. And after you've cut the DNA, you could either, the cell has different ways to fix it and repair it. Um, and these are, you know, these are kind of tricky to operate with. So if you want to modify your sequence, um, you can either, the cell will either do something called non-homology and joining or homology directed repair. Um, and for that, you need extra bits of DNA that basically will flank the regions where you want your modification to happen. And the efficiency is pretty low in, in certain, in many cells. Um, so, you know, using this system to modify DNA through breaks and cutting and pasting DNA and pasting, um, uh, you know, it's where, you know, labs are still trying to optimize the efficiency of this, right? So, so changing the DNA through actually changing the, the nucleotides themselves, um, the CRISPR-Cas9 system is really good for this introductory break, um, but then you've got to do other things as well to, to modify the sequences that are there. Um, but there's actually more subtle ways to, um, to basically uh, get the system to switch genes on and off, and that's through modifying the epigenome. And one thing that, uh, that the, um, the original paper way back in 2012 now did was they made, um, they, in their studies and their analysis of Cas9, let me go back a few slides here. Where is this? This right here. You've got these endonuclease domains. So you've got one that cuts here and one that cuts here, this rub C domain, this HMH domain. Um, you can mutate these and you can make a nuclease, you can make a Cas9 that only cuts once, or you can make a Cas9 that does not cut in either, either um, location. And that's referred to as a D-Cas9 or a dead Cas9. So it's enzymatically dead, it doesn't do anything. Um, yet it can still interact with its guide RNA and it can still go to a location. So it's basically, you will be guiding this whole system to bind to a location in the genome, but it won't cut the DNA. It won't do anything. It'll just go there and sit there. Um, and that opens up a lot of possibilities for making fusion proteins. So basically adding things onto this Cas9. So when it's guided to a location, um, it can do some sort of modification that is more subtle than basically breaking the DNA and putting a double-stranded break in. Right? So I'm just gonna skip through here. So this is just a summary of, of some of these different CASs that people have made. Um, they've made double Nickase versions where only one site is mutated. So um, this allows um, homologous recombination to be more efficient. So you can make one, one break here, one break here using two different guide RNAs. Um, you can also, it, more akin to this paper here, you can attach things such as activators that can then switch on genes. So basically, instead of, um, instead of cloning an activator that's going to go to, you know, finding out what the, what the actual activator is that's going to activate a promoter, you can just make your own activator by having a, a guide RNA that targets it upstream of a gene and having a, a powerful activator fused to this cas You can do the opposite with repressor as well. Or you could add fluorescent molecules such as, or fluorescent proteins like GFP, so you can localize and see where things are within the genome. Uh, so you can do, you can do all of those things. And this paper here, basically, um, they made a, a series of complex fusion proteins that very robustly um, will methylate um, uh, cytosines at CPG islands within, within uh, genomes. And they basically looked at many, many locations and showed that this was a very, very robust effect. Um, and no doubt uh, we're all basically um, now interested in this in the field of aging to see if these modifications can then be applied to aging cells to see if the epigenome, um, if we can make Cas9 derivatives similar to this and guide them and direct them to locations that are um, that are methylated, um, that their methylation status changes uh, with regards to aging and see if we can, we can reverse those effects and see, you know, I'm 
really in, interested in kind of piecing out and seeing, you know, how much of a role, for example, the epigenome plays in aging. Um, so if you can reverse it, uh, aspects of it, um, how much of an aging reversal can you get, or or or, or how much of aging in a metazoan is due is a composite, um, you know, due to other events happening as well, um, and certainly. People have delivered, um, I believe, CRISPR-Cas9 and other enzymes to mice using um, uh, AVS1 uh, using adenoviral vectors. So this, you know, so certainly these these experiments are doable right now. Um, at least, uh, maybe not um, not yet ready for humans, but certainly for uh, preliminary use uh, studies. So um, let's take a look at the paper itself. Um, and parts thereof. Let's share the screen here. So genome-wide programmable transcriptional memory by CRISPR-based genome editing. So what do they actually do? So scroll through here. These are all my highlights. Uh, you have your own highlights. Okay, so uh, in Figure One A, they basically um, they point out the the types of they they have some controls here. Um, in Figure One A, they they illustrate um, what sort of how the fusion proteins were laid out. Um, so the they have uh, some methyl transferases here, DNA T three A. Um, they have a repressor, crab, uh, and they have various basically versions of this. So when you make a fusion protein, um, you know, where you have this fused, and this is a little cartoon diagram here, uh, you have to have different sizes of linkers, so different, you know, stretches of amino acids. Um, so you basically have to empirically determine what's going to be the most optimal configuration of how you fuse these proteins together. So they don't basically, um, you know, bump into one another or inhibit their activity uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, so they use these, um, I believe, uh, these human embryonic kidney cells, 293 T cells, uh, and they basically transfect them. So this is going to be a transient transfection. Um, and they have a GFP reporter um, downstream of a number of different genes. Um, and they then uh, look and see whether or not GFP is then being switched off in these cells. So uh, they have two different versions of this, uh, of this CRISPR repressor system that's, uh, that's a methyl transferase base. One is called CRISPR off V1, and there's another variant that I think is a bit more robust later, I have to check, called CRISPR off V2. Um, and I have kind of a technical question here. I'm not exactly 100% sure why um, uh, why they need, so crab domain is, I believe, a repressor and the DNMT3A is a methyl transferase. Um, uh, when you look at the data here, um, so this is percent cells with GFP off, and this is days post-transfection. So having just a repressor, uh, it'll temporarily shut down, to, you know, so you've got the guide RNA that's going to direct this to your promoter that's going to be running your GFP, and you're going to repress, you know, you're going to get a blip, you're going to get a percentage off on crab, uh, which is a repressor, and it's going to go, go down pretty rapidly, 10 days post-transfection. Um, and these effects are longer lasting, obviously, with a, um, when you um, have a methyl transferase. Um, question here is, um, so, they get a more robust response when they have the repressor bound to the CRISPR off V1 versus just D3A3L. Um, and I'm not 100% sure. I know they, they reference another paper, I believe, from 2016, where they basically built the system. And I'm not 100% sure why you would get a much more robust effect with this crack domain, uh, repressor domain. Um, it's a good thing. It's it's you know, but I I would think that you know once you've got your methyl transfer, once you've got your methylation status altered, it would be just as robust. But um, but perhaps it's recruiting other methyl transferases. That's the only thing. I don't want to be a little bit hand wavy here. That this crack domain is recruiting other methyl transferases in conjunction with the 
DM, DNMT3A that they have in the 3L, uh, but they are getting a much, much more robust response with their CRISPR off V1 system that they have here. So this is percentage cells with GFP off. So, um, so that is that is good. Um, the other series of experiments they look at is, um, well, taking, taking a look and seeing um, if the methylation status actually changes. And they do something called bisulfite sequencing. Um, and that's a technique that, you know, I've never employed here, but um, I do have slides. Uh, so let's take a look at here. Um, same slides here. Um, hopefully you can see these slides. So bisulfite sequencing. Um, so basically it's a chemical treatment where uh, cytosine residues, if there's methyl cytosine, if you treat it with bisulfite, um, this methyl group actually protects it from chemical changes that will cause it to convert from cytosine to uracil, right? So basically, um, and then once that happens, um, you can then use sequencing uh, to see whether or not you have uracils there or you still have cytosines and it will tell you whether or not it's methylated. Um, and being on the cytosine that protects it against the bisulfite treatment or unmethylated, right? Um, so that's basically, go back here. So uh, I'm, I hope I shared those slides, right? I did share those slides, good. So I'm not sharing those slides not right now. So it's not, it's not clear sometimes this, uh, this software, it doesn't, you know, we should more clearly, you know, Told me whether or not I'm sharing or not sharing. It doesn't do that. So, um, so that's bisulfite sequencing. So they basically, um, so they check to make sure that the methylation status actually changes. And we'll go back to share the screen. And yes, it does. Uh, so they look at this location. So this is GFP that's on and then GFP off. And the, the black is basically um, different, different, the, all these arrays are different um, sequencing runs and different areas. I'm not sure why they, I see this in bisulfite sequencing papers. They have, they use these little circles to basically denote areas that are, that are um, methylated. Um, and I'm not sure why, why that's the, why that's the standard format, how they show it. looks like many six well plate to me, but, uh, but basically more black, more methylation. And basically um, that's what it, um, that's what it uh, uh, pertains to. Um, so, um, so the methylation status um, uh, changes, and it's pretty robust. Uh, they do. They also look at, uh, at this location. Um, so they're looking at just one location here, one gene. Uh, they do a fact sorting, fluorescence activated cell sorting, uh, and they show that CRISPR off, off 50 days post transfection. It's a pretty robust, um, you know, long term effect. So 50 days after they do this. Um, you have you have a an off response using the CRISPR um, off V1. Let me just scroll down here. Remind myself H. Um, um, and of course, they look at other genes. They look at ITGV1, CD81, CD151. So these are genes that are non-essential, uh, meaning that you know changing their status isn't going to isn't going to cell or or harm it in any way. So they can basically look at these uh, different locations. Um, and again, percentage cells with gene off, uh, three weeks post-transfection, uh, V1, V2. So for whatever reason, they mentioned it in the paper that this V2, I think, is, is having this configuration uh, for their, you know, for their um, fusion protein. So having the crab domain here, um, I want to say that that's the um, C terminus. Um, probably the C terminus and then and having the other ones at the other terminus, you know, is, uh, is, is, is a better, um, works better um, for, for whatever fusion protein reasons uh, there is. Um, okay, so I'm gonna kind of stop sharing pause here. If anybody has any questions thus far. No, okay. Nothing on Facebook at all, not not yet. So I can only imagine you've answered all of their questions. Although you did have a question of your own earlier. I'm yeah, afraid I, we, we can't answer that. You're yeah, the expert. 
Uh, well, I, I'd have to go back to the earlier paper to see what what the what the boosting is from the crab domain uh, for the for the other for the other um, you know. Uh, it, it works very good, very well. Um, I'm just wondering what the additional repressor domain um, is adding as far as a long-term effect. Um, clearly it is, um, but I have, to, I have to go in there and, and check. So let's uh, go back to the paper. Um, so let's see, what else do they do? So they do also, so now we're getting into, so I, J, K, um, in L, they're looking at uh, multiplexing. So they're looking at not just IT GB1, CD81, CD151 uh, single, but they're looking at double and I believe also triple silencing. Uh, do we have some questions there? We've got a little pinging happening up there. Chat. No? Okay. Oh, that was John. Uh, John says, excellent background summary of CRISPR Cas9. Thanks. And it was. Oh. You really should do some uh, expl short explainer videos with us at some point, Oliver. So uh, I might uh, run that by you a bit later. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, I mean, the ex explanation part was fun um, because, you know, it's. Uh, I've, I've introduced that, uh, just now I'm going to segue for a little bit here. I've, I've introduced, I've, I've had ran a CRISPR course for a number of years at, at, at um, several years ago at uh, Space, um, an open biotech lab. And then I've, I've obviously put together labs for students CRISPR, but it's, uh, but then, you know, I try to figure out how to best present the material and, and, uh, and yeah, it's kind of startling where they you, you've got these, you know, these kind of weird historical, um, comparisons, right? You're like, you know, it's like, wait, you know, um, restriction endonucleases are, are an innate immune system of, bio, of, of bacteria, and then they're co-opted for biotech, and then, then you discover an acquired immune system, and that's co-opted to biotech, right? So we're basically using the immune system of bacteria, which is a key scientific discovery, to basically um, change the genomes of pretty much every organism and every family out there on this planet right so it's pretty wild and quickly as well that's the the main thing compared to older systems like zinc fingers and talons um mm -hmm. it's considerably faster from what i understand yes. and uh, and a bit easier although you do see people still using uh talons and things like that still yeah um, I'm, I'm i'm not i'm again i don't i you know i've, I've never worked with those so i, I don't know why why you would. Um, you know, it's just um, designing guide RNAs, um, which is basically cloning a cloning a gene, uh, you know, a very short segment of DNA onto a plasmid is, you know, trivial compared to compared to designing a programmable endonuclease that's the same thing endonuclease from scratch. Uh, you know, I mean, you know, it's it's uh, in order or two or three, you know, it's a big difference between, you know, between the background you need to do do one or the other um, and the fact that you can uh, also uh, churn out thousands of different guide RNAs you know and then just kind of which they do in this paper here and then transfect cells and then basically see what sticks essentially um, is really powerful right so so any anybody can basically now have a programmable endonuclease or, or has had the capability for you know since 2012 essentially right so that's uh you know um it's really brought programmable endonucleases to the masses essentially that's uh you know that's the that's the power of this um technology and these and these derivatives too right so these um uh you know and i was before we jumped on i was kind of joking saying you know you want a paper in nature make a make a fusion protein out of cas9 and direct it to some location in the genome your favorite location and 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 characterize the you know the, the out of it and uh, and and if you do a good job characterizing it, um, you will you will get a published paper. Of course, they do a really good job here. Uh, that's a lot of labs on this paper, and they basically look at thousands of different genes. Uh, they looked at a couple so far, um, but they really kind of crank it up. Um, this figure here, figure two. Mm -hmm. paper is now splitting. I should like reorganize 
kind of rejigger everything before I get on online because figure, figure legends are split all over the papers. So it's not very conducive to should convert this to slides. Not very conducive to actually um, talking about it and, uh, and presenting it. So um, what do they do here? They do RNA seq plots of these HEC293 T cells. Uh, so basically, look at RNA expression levels. Um, so uh, in various different, various different uh, configurations and various different genes, because you know you've looked at they've looked at and showed that the methylation status changes at this location. Uh, what else did they do? Um, I've already forgotten Figure One. Um, they looked at methylation status. Uh, oh, and they looked at of course GFP expression. Um, and here they look at um, uh, they look at. I think they do a uh, RNA, uh, you know, expression analysis um, showing that uh, you know they have a control that they have uh, non-targeting uh, guide RNA versus guide RNA that's targeting, and they show that you know off of this um, off of this uh, you know curve here, you see a decrease in these in these genes. But they also, I think, they do in throughout multiple chromosomes and multiple locations, they look at RNA expression levels to show that it's basically uh, focused, right? So um, higher, I think this is a negative value here, right? So, um, so this is a control here of guide RNAs. So the control guide RNAs that's non-specific, and this is specific for CLTA. Uh, what do they look at here? So negative log 10. So this is going to be back to this figure. Where's the legend? Uh, was it Manhattan plot? It's called a Manhattan plot because it looks like a cross section of Manhattan uh, with uh, displaying differentially methylated CPGs between cells. Um, Red dots represent CPGs that gain. Oh, okay, so they're looking at DNA methylation and targeting blue dot CPGs that gain. So it's um, Sorry, that's not that's that one is not a RNA expression plot. That's uh, looking at methylation status um, in uh, in these various cells, and this is genomic position. And I'm not 100% sure what the spread of those dots is. Uh, let's see, so this is chromosome one, two, three, four, five. So 22 chromosome X. Um, so methylation status is peaking here, um, and I'm not sure. Um, not sure what the what the width in bases that is exactly. Um, but I have to go. I have to go into the paper, and, and I did know it, and then I kind of forgot it. So basically, you have you have a spike at CLTA this position. Um, one other thing that they mentioned in the paper. Uh, so they do, <clears throat> the cool thing about this paper is I think they do make two kind of key discoveries here um, using this technology. Um, one is that when they look at the methylation status of this one gene here, um, I think it's, it's in the text of the paper, um, but they looked at other genes as well and they picked up methylation changes in other locations as well that go up. Um, this might not be a good good reference here to point to because um, this is probably not the best way to, to look at it. I'm not going to say that this one here is spiking here, but they make a note that other locations, um, the methylation status changes. And this could be due to one of two things. One is that it could be due to non-specific targeting of, you know, off offsite targeting of the methyl transferase, or it could actually be real in that um, this gene here is somehow regulating the methylation status um, at another location. Um, indirectly by itself being methylated um, and then changing the functionality of another methyl transferase or some, something else that basically regulates a distant gene. So this, you know, so they could have, they potentially have made some key discoveries in this paper uh, pertaining, uh, you know, pertaining to um, how genes are perhaps regulated um, if, it, if it ends up not being an off-target effect. Um, is there anything that we'd like to go through in this paper here, on this, on this figure here? Let's see, figure two, that's gonna tell us more. Um, they do a chip seek. Um, no. 
So figure three, and I think they look at now reversibility. So they do, they do the off, which is basically um, the Cas9 that's fused to the methyl transferases. And uh, now they, they also have these uh, vectors uh, which have a, an activator. So this basically, um, so they have this uh, TET1, XTN16, uh, and XTN80. Um, and this is a little bit different. Um, it's some of these are fusion proteins. Um, so I believe that's a, that's a demethylase. Um, and they have this version here at four. Uh, so, so they have these trans activators. So they have a modified, so in this case, this, uh, so they have this, uh, I'm gonna to have to remind myself, it's been a while since I read this. Um, this is kind of a really neat, it's not really a fusion protein. So the TET B4 is a fusion protein, like I mentioned, but they have a guide RNA that it's itself modified with what's referred to as aptamer. So it's basically a longer guide RNA that the guide RNA is targeting the system in to a location, uh, but they have these uh, proteins which bind to these aptamers on the guide RNA. Um, and basically tether these trans-activator trans domains to switch on a protein. Um, and I'm not sure why they had to fabricate it like this. It could be that there's just too much stuff already used to your Cas9 protein, um, but they have basically, um, so this VP64, these are all basically, um, you know, uh, these are, these are trans-activators. So this is a way, a powerful way for them to switch on uh, switch on genes. So this is their on system. So they basically repeat these experiments using now your GFP silent cells that were silenced from, I believe, uh, using their off system. So these are um, silenced long-term um, and they use this uh, TET1, uh, which one is this? I believe the version one which then basically reactivates and reverses the, the methylation status of, of, uh, of, these, of the location of the CLT1 gene. Um, and they basically test several of these versions and the TET1 is not so great. And again, this TET version four, uh, this fusion protein variant is, is, is working the best. And I'm not 100% sure why it's working the best uh, versus um, these other configurations, but percentage reactivated are, are 80%. Um, and then they do a, a, um, a fluorescence activated cell sorting and uh, pre-TET1, this is the methylation status at the location of the gene. And post, you basically have a, a reversal of, of this effect. So they're basically demonstrating their TET, uh, their, their Cas9, uh, their CRISPR on system, let's call it, as, as being basically functional and, and reversing um, being able to reverse the system here. So I have to remind myself and um, go into this. Um, okay. okay, so I'm gonna pause here. Um, any questions about that? I have a few questions probably about the about the aptamer based system, um, but um, that's kind of getting into sort of the technical details as to why they had the aptamer based system. I think the aptamer based system is Kind of having a dual role. I have to double check that. One is that it's uh, demethylating this the site, and then it's bringing in activators to switch on the genes as well. Um, let me, yeah, Michael. Yeah, I was surprised to see the aptamers in this paper. Like aptamers are a thing that I usually associate with cool proof of concept papers, like you get this DNA sequence that binds mm -hmm. something, and then that they actually used it in a construct that wasn't specifically meant to prove that aptamers can do it. Oh right, so they're actually using it. They're 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 using it in a useful role rather than prove they're demonstrating that the aptamers are, are functional. Like, yeah, practical like, applications of aptamers, yeah. I think, are pretty rare. So that was kind of cool to see from my in my opinion. Yeah, and I don't know how many papers. I mean, as far as like you know, me kind of joking and saying, yeah, you make a fusion protein of Cas9. I mean, 
you know, this is pretty complex here. They've got a fusion protein at Cas9, and then they've got the guide RNA with like a, a, a bound, like, you know, an aptamer that, uh, so it's, you know, so you've got your, your, your variable region of the guide RNA, you've got your constant region, and then you've got your aptamer, and this is all functioning, right? So it's, uh, it's a, quite a bit of a Frankensteinian, you know, um, Cas9 system here. It's the impressive camp. that it all works. <laughs> Yeah, it can't really get much more Frankensteinian. So, you know, you've got a, you get a fusion RNA and you've got a fusion protein, right? So the whole thing is a fusion, which is pretty, pretty cool. Um, so it's, uh, so yeah, so I believe, I believe that's their, 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 because those are activators. So I believe the uh, trans activator domain specifically. So I believe that they're switching it on, you know, they're both doing a demethylation and then they're also bringing an activator there as well to, to robustly turn on the gene. Um, not just demethylate it and to show that you basically get um, expression. Uh, so they're doing they're doing two things here in this paper. Um, you know they they start off with the with the CRISPR off and then they have the uh, the CRISPR on system here. Um, okay, so let's let's go back to my sharing screen. Sorry, the windows open. There we go. Uh, so okay, so um, so they go on to next figure, which is looking at genome-wide gene silencing. So we're basically um, uh, so uh, so let's see what do they do here. Um, so I want to say that uh, they do at some point they basically. Is it in this figure or the next figure? Um, uh, so CLTA1 um, expression. So what are they doing here? Because they're only targeting one gene. So they've got a dual SG RNA vector, uh, two guide RNAs, HEC293 cells, uh, transfect with CRISPR sort passage phenotype. Um, and then they get a phenotype score. Um, so they're basically, so let's see, essential and non-essential genes. So um, why are they just focusing on CLTA? Uh, let's see, hold on a second. I thought they were, this was a, this figure was the library where they basically target every single um, gene within transmit pools of plasma. There's a lot of stuff here. Um, okay, uh, yeah, design, okay, yeah. Design is uh, SGRNA where library targets over 20,000 protein coding genes and includes uh, 1,000 non-targeting um, SGRNAs. Oops, okay. Um, encode two unique protospacers targeting the same, okay, all right. So they basically are, so they're basically using two they, they show that it's more robust if they uh, target two guide RNAs to, um, uh, to two unique protospacers targeting the same gene. And that's something I kind of glossed over. Um, when you, um, actually, let me, let me do a new share here. Hopefully you can see this. I have now my PowerPoint slides. Um, so when you design this guide RNA, um, you've, you've, you, there's software that helps you um, target this to different locations. And it's basically obviously looking for a match between where it's gonna go. But there also needs to be this little funny area called a protospacer adjacent motif. Um, and it's basically, um, um, in this case here, it's a sequence um, NGG, and that's basically for um, one species of particular Cas9, but there's different types of protospacer adjacent motifs that are specific for different species and different um, synthetic guide RNAs. Um, this binds to the Cas9 protein, um, and so you need this to basically get the whole thing to complex initially um, before a heteroduplex can form here. So when you when you design guide RNAs, your software is looking for two things. It's looking for obviously 
the sequence that you know it's going to design it for, but it initially looks for locations of these PAM sites, protospace for JSON cubes, NGG, and then the 20 MERS sequence is, is then optimized uh, relative to that. Um, and these PAM sites are small, right? So it's only two Gs and they vary. Some, some are Ts, some are Gs, some are you know different variations. So depending on which CAS you use, you pretty much can get, you know, um, even though you you know there is a restriction, uh, you can you can pretty much design it to to almost anywhere. So <clears throat> what they did was they designed two guide RNAs that um, are guiding two different guide RNAs to two different PAM sites within within the gene, and um, that's giving them a more uh, more robust effect. Um, so you know that's that's some of the nitty gritty that you need to need to know when you when you design design guide RNAs, but there's there's software out there that basically helps you helps you do that. Um, okay, so uh, share screen back again. Okay, so they uh, lost. Me. Okay, so they all right. So they designed dual guide RNAs that basically are targeting. Uh, wow, so they must have designed, you know, like what forty thousand different guide RNAs. It's pretty wild. Um, how much did that cost design? Really? I mean, that's that's uh, that's huge. Yeah, constructed the sgRNA library to code two unique protospaces targeting the same gene per lentiviral vector uh, because their experiments show improvement when using multiple guide RNA is targeting the same gene. So prior work and table S3. Um, and then they performed growth-based pools because gene essentiality. So um, so yeah. So let's go to uh, so they have a so they're basically doing a control here. They have a CRISPR off mutant. Um, which I believe is, um, uh, an, it's basically a transient repression, but not a, um, not a, not a long-term, not a long-term shutdown of, of the gene. So it doesn't have an active methyl transferase. Um, and they basically look at, uh, basically look at, look at the phenotypes. And this is sort of kind of, not really 100% sure how to define this, but they get they get a phenotype score here, um, which basically the phenotype score is how well the growth rate is affected based on the amount of guide RNA that's that's transfected, and um, uh, basically um, they look at essential genes that are you know these are essential genes that are being targeted. Um, they know which are essential because. You know, obviously they design guide RNAs and non-essential genes. Um, and you can see that this, this kind of violin graph here shows you that this phenotype score basically means you have a more uh, slower growth rate, essentially, right? So essentially what's happening is that, um, that um, more essential genes that are being targeted, the slower the, the growth rate is that, you know, it's kind of, in mass, in aggregate, this is my understanding here. You can correct me if I'm wrong, or maybe get into the details if somebody wants to contribute. Um, in the aggregate, it's telling you that um, that these guide RNAs are are targeting um, these essential genes, and you are getting growth rates affected um, versus your your control, which is basically more of a transient uh, transient effect. Um, and uh, and then and that this is this is targeting um, capable of targeting multiple genes, um, and they're going to kind of look at that one in a little bit more specificity uh, later on. So let me share my screen here. Um, and then the more interesting thing. And this is probably their other key scientific discovery. Um, is so they they have a methyl transferase that's basically affecting uh, stretches of known you know what are known as CPG islands. So cytosine, you know, phosphodiester backbone, guanosine. So 
cytosines that are methylated. Um, and it's predicted that these methylation regions happen in, um, in areas that are enriched. Um, so there's certain, there's certain parameters that are known uh, that you can define a CBG island. Um, but they also noted that there's, they've this find, found areas that are being, their methylation status changed. Um, and these are not canonical CPG islands. So these are figure five, CRISPR op mediated silencing of genes without promoter CPG island annotations. Um, and these are some of the genes here, DYNC2LI1, LAMP2, MYL6, so on and so forth. Um, and what they basically, um, what they demonstrate here is, uh, what they demonstrate here is that basically um, that they're getting that they're getting targeted silencing um, at these locations um, using their system, even though they're not a CPG island, um, and it's pretty robust. Fifty days post transfection here in Figure Five I, um, it's pretty robust um, this methylation, and it's you know it's um, uh, and their system's able to do it now. I guess the question you can ask is, you know, maybe their maybe their system is really really strong. So you know, maybe in the natural, uh, in under a natural system, this doesn't normally occur. But having having a two guide RNAs targeting your your very strong CRISPR off system with your synthetic methyl transferase fusion protein and and Crab one domain or Crab domain is is going to really really robustly methylate, you know, areas that even, you know, that are not normally, you know, methylated or regulated, right? So that's, that's another interpretation. Um, uh, still good, because that means that you've got a really strong um, methyl transferase guided system here. And, you know, and, and it's certainly, you could probably, I can imagine making it weaker if that's a problem, or maybe transiently expressing it for a shorter period of time, if that's a problem, right? So, or maybe it's not a problem. Maybe, maybe, I don't know, I'd have to take a look in the literature and see whether, you know, maybe these areas are normally methylated, uh, you know, or, or regulated via, via methylation. So that's, uh, I'm not sure if the authors, um, uh, you know, um, how deeply they unravel that in this paper. I don't recall them um, other than mentioning that and talking about it, obviously, because they have a whole figure here directly to it. I'm not sure. Um, to go back to this paper here. I'm not sure how much of a background. So um, it's figure five. Last to probe the extent across non-CGI annotated. So um, Gene, we performed. Uh, so more based on these findings, we propose a theoretical framework of CGI gene annotation does not always predict the presence of functional CBG sites, bolstering the power of CRISPR off and CRISPR on for functional testing of CBG methylation in modulating gene expression. Um, so yeah, that's, um, and they mentioned here also that it is estimated that 30% of human genes are not associated with a promoter CBG island. Um, so, you know, it's, uh, it's possible that these are legitimately regulated in such a way. And, you know, this is a discovery that this, that this tool, which can have, you know, um, technological applications, um, certainly for the aging community, um, this, this could be, you know, um, you know, they, they may have performed a screen here <laughs> to find non-canonical CPG islands um, that are methylated. Um, right. So um, this might be my ignorance speaking, but in their figure five for their non-canonical methylation, it looks like they've got stuff downstream of the transcription start site. So like, are these things actually in the, um, in the gene itself, like in the coding region, these yeah. um, methylated sites? Uh, well, they mentioned that, they mentioned, uh, so you said they're downstream of the transcription start site, right? So they would be within the gene, right? Somewhere in uh, I, I think if you look at 5E, um, yeah. they have the TSS. Um, yeah. I mean, not, not for M M MYL6, but for the other two. Uh, yeah, so yeah, let's see what's percent. So um, um, 
Well, what is it? That's uh, that's nucleotides, right? On the on the on the x-axis, yeah. On the x-axis, yeah. So um, so yeah, I mean, it's it's uh, so it's certainly overlapping. Um, uh, it's certainly. So I'm a little. Uh, so I know that obviously the methylation status is going to affect the promoter region, but there is. Um, I don't know these. I mean, could be that the that the regulatory site overlaps uh, the TSS and the little bit ways into the gene in, in, in within these genes. Not exactly certain how the promoter functions in LAMP2 and um, MYL6. Um, yeah, certainly here it's a little bit. It's a bit upstream. Right, uh, and here it's it's a little bit upstream, but also, you know, across the TSS. And I'm not sure if these are known to have a promoter that overlaps um, with, uh, you know, past the past the transcriptional um, start site. Um, is that is that the question? Why the methylation status kind of goes right through into the into the coding region? Yeah, it just seems like a really unusual region. That they they don't seem to comment on it too much in the text. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it could be that LAMP2 and, and DYNC2LI1, it could be that the, that the regulatory region somehow overlaps over the, over the transcriptional start site, over the, you know, that, that you've got the promoter area kind of overlapping with, or the, you know, some, the, could be a side, I don't know, overlapping with with an area that's a part of a part of a five prime untranslated region on a transcript that's coming out of and maybe that's something peculiar to lamp two and you want in c2 l one I'm not sure I'm not sure okay so um let's see what do they do in figure six here. Um, this is a little different. Uh, might get a little hazy here. Pooled as sgRNA tiling screens. Reveal a wide targetable window of crispr off mediated gene repression. Um, and I must confess here that I, I don't really, I, <laughs> I haven't been able to get through thus far into the paper here, so I can't I can't comment on this. Um, does anybody need want to comment on the sgRNA tiling screen that was done up until this point here? You're not alone. I didn't get this far either. Yeah. Um, let's see if there's a hint in Figure Seven here. Um, this figure Seven is is Figure Seven is pretty cool. Figure Seven is they basically look at um, gene silencing and. Induce pluripotent stem cells, so iPSC derived neurons and enhancers. Um, and the punchline is, is that it's functioning in these induced pluripotent stem cells as well. Um, so basically, um, CRISPR off system. So, uh, so they look at the CD81 uh, region in uh, iPSCs and also neurons uh, that are derived from these uh, cells. So they transfect CRISPR off, sort transfected cells, sort you know, cells that basically have CD81 um, silenced. So these are in iPSC cells, um, and then they induce them to basically differentiate into neurons. Um, and all through this time, you know, you this location, the CD81 location uh, has been um, maintained stably, um, methylated, and um, after targeting with with their you know with the with their uh, uh, with their CRISPR off system, um, you basically uh, so let's see this is so they, oh this is before they so this is so they're able to target it in in the cells, um, and after so this uh, they so they show that you get a robust maintenance of of uh, repression all through all through induction. So, so after the cells have converted into neurons, um, you still get you still get this effect that's um, pretty pretty robust. So that's that's pretty cool. So the cells, you know, um, so when the cells are you know uh, 
are converting probably through the addition of Yamanaka factors from iPSCs to neurons, you're getting a lot of epigenomic changes, but you're looking at a region that's not being you know, changed. So this is basically being stably maintained throughout, um, throughout basically, uh, uh, throughout basically uh, conversion to, um, I'll pause here for a moment. Uh, uh, throughout conversion um, of of the cells from uh, from IPSC form to to uh, the neuronal form, um, so that's pretty impressive. Um, let's see what else they do here. Let me go back to sharing my screen. I believe they look at another location that's also. Uh, required for, so they, they silence another location that's required for uh, microtubule associated protein tau, which is obviously phosphorylated, hyperphosphorylated in um, neurodegenerative disorders. Um, so they look at, so this is a, you know, CD81. Um, they do bisulfite sequencing, they show that it's changed. Um, and then they do, um, so they also target uh, CRISPR off. So iPSCs transfected with CRISPR off and MAPT targeting um, RNA. Um, and I believe they show that they can get the same thing. Uh, say cells with tau off, percent cells with tau off. Um, G, what is G? Quantification tau expression in neurons differentiated from RPSCs transfected with CRISPR off. And then T or MAPSIs Sorry, I got to familiarize myself with it. I jumped into this figure here. And, um, hmm. uh, figure is completely not helping me. Let me go back to, to the paper and see if I can. Uh, CRISPR off targeting CA1 or a non targeting control. If I say, hmm, okay, let's got that. Okay, so they're targeting MAPT, gene that encodes tau protein, implicate, yep. Um, transcriptionally repressed in iPSCs. Um, okay, so this one is repressed um, by histone. Um, H3 um, lysine 27 um, rather than DNA methylation. Okay, so now they're not just targeting um, now. So this this location is is a uh, is, is so it's the methylation of the histones. Uh, persist to silence map T. Um, oh, NT, non targeting control. I was wondering, I was like, NT protein. Um, we measured tau protein level on 30 and reduced down. Okay. Okay, so just reading this backwards, I'm like, why is tau protein staining going up? So percent cells with tau off, all right? So, okay, so, so yeah, so 30% of cells are not tau protein staining. So that's 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 where I'm totally, I was totally confused about this. It was like, why is staining going up if tau is going down? It's because tau protein staining is going down in 30% of the cells versus a control. Um, okay, so that's, uh, Let's stop sharing here. That was my confusion there. <laughs> I'm trying to get that. Um, so they're able to they're able to knock down uh, tau protein um, in differentiated cells. So they're able to use 
they're able to use the system um, in IPSCs that uh, that that um, uh, that were um, differentiated neurons, as well as a multitude of other cells, HAC293 cells, and a number of other cell types that they used. Um, and I guess the key takeaway is there's there's you know a lot more data in here, but they do a really really good job basically looking at a whole bunch of locations and. The one thing that they still stress is that they have to make sure that there's still no off-target, you know, effects. That's something that every CRISPR-Cas paper worries about is um, making sure that there's no uh, no targeting to other effects. Certainly, they mentioned that earlier when they show that the methylation status of certain areas changes, not just the ones that they targeted. Um, that could be due to the fact that it's a real effect that changing the methylation status of the gene you're targeting with a guide RNA is going to change the methylation status of another gene because, right, um, one thing is connected to the other and maybe that's maybe that's a downstream effect or you're non-specifically targeting, um, you know, targeting it, which which is would be more of a problematic uh, technical problem there. Um, so we're not 100% sure, you know, whether it's one, one or the other. Um, but I think um, this technology right now that's demonstrated in this paper is certainly mature enough uh, to go ahead with experiments, certainly in mammalian models, um, metazoan models, you know, mouse models, um, certainly, you know, tissue culture models to see whether or not you can get a, a reversal, you know, of, of aging phenotypes uh, based, on, based on an altered methylation status. Um, and, and of course, if you can alter the methylation status, then you can no doubt adapt this system uh, to change the acetylation status of, of areas and, and also other epigenetic modifications uh, that you can, you can perhaps perform um, using this system. So it's, um, it's pretty powerful. Um, you can certainly use it to, you know, see if... It, uh, to probe how much of how much of the um, epigenome actually does influence influence the genome, and I think this this tool here is the most specific tool. To sum up, is the most specific tool we have thus far to doing that. Otherwise, the only thing we have are you know um, non-specific chemicals that basically can reverse the methylation status or or change you know demethylases or or, or you know or or basically non-specific ways to kind of generically alter the epigenetic status. But this gives, you know, using this modified CRISPR system here, um, uh, we, you know, I guess to put it bluntly, we don't have a much more precise tool at our disposal currently. That is, I would say that this, this paper illustrates the state of the art for, for, um, uh, for modifying, you know, for, for modifying areas of the genome with the caveat that we have to make sure that, you know, that the, the, this isn't being targeted elsewhere, right? Um, because you are, you are using software to design guide RNAs to go to specific locations and uh, you have to make sure that they're not, not accidentally going somewhere else as well, right? I'm actually kind of wondering if for like aging applications, a certain degree of non-specificity might be desirable. Like, um, so it's kind of the opposite of what you, what people talk about in the CRISPR field. But like earlier in, the, in this talk, you were we were talking about the Horvath clock and how maybe mm -hmm. you use a technology like this to change um, epigenetic age. Problem is the Horvath clock is affecting, or all the epigenetic clocks are affecting a whole ton of sites. So the notion of like specifically targeting each and every one of those sites with this technology or any technology is seems kind of crazy to me. Like you want to make 500 edits, mm -hmm. but um, on the other hand, like what if you had something that was like kind of semi-specific? Like imagine you had a degenerate guide RNA, which is kind of specific, but actually hits mm -hmm. like a hundred different sites. Yeah. So I'm think like you, you, like like you mentioned chemical mod modifiers to epigenetic. Like you use azacitidine, you not you mm -hmm. mess up everything. Um, but what if you had something in the middle where you don't mess up everything, you don't mess up one thing, but maybe you change methylation status of a few hundred sites. That actually seems kind of interesting to me from an aging perspective, because maybe that's the order of magnitude of effect that we're actually seeing. 
And that's 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 actually really that's a good idea actually um i didn't think about that that's um you know you can certainly i mean with with crispr and guide rnas you have so much flexibility you can certainly make degenerate guide rnas that basically are you know um have less specificity like you said and might might target might target uh, a lot of a lot of locations um yeah um you know the problem is the, the pro one of the key problems, though, that still is yet to be really overcome is not so much this part of the technology, but the delivery aspect of it, um, because, um, you know, the vector we, you know, um, there's, there's really, uh, well, there's, there's, for, 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 for gene therapy, there's really three problems. One is cutting the precise location, um, which is kind of solved with CRISPR. Number two is getting uh, recombination occur at that location, which is still a problem if, if you're going to be changing the gene uh, for a number of cells, the efficiency is pretty low, and, and the delivery, making sure that all the cells you need to target are being targeted. And different aspects of these have been solved in different platforms, right? So you can, delivery system might be not a problem if you're doing your, your, your manipulation in vitro and then putting your T cells back, like CAR T cell therapy back into the patient. But if you want to target every single cell in a human body, well, that's a problem, right? That's um, if you're if you're if you're going to put an adenoviral vector, um, it's not going to hit like every cell. It's some cells that'll it'll preferentially hit. I think hepatocytes. I, I think it might not hit um, intestinal cells. So there's certain cells that you know there there it's got a, like a, a preference, and there's a certain so so. You're, you're not going to get like this 100%, you know, response, right? So especially if we're going to be dealing with, you know, let's say, let's, let's kind of speculate into the future and say, oh, okay, well, let's say most of aging comes from, you know, the Horvath clock, the, the, the epigenome status changes, right? Um, you know, in theory, well, okay, let's just reset everything, you know, and in practice, how do you reset everything? You can do it in a Petri dish, but how are you going to get to glial cells in the brain? How are you going to get to, you know, how's your delivery system going to get to 50 plus trillion cells, right? And, or, you know, maybe it doesn't need to hit all of them, but, but maybe you just need to hit most of them. I don't, I don't know. That's, so the delivery is still a problem. Can we even deliver CRISPR-Cas9 with AAV or is AAV too small since that's like a tiny virus? Um, they've got a different version. There's like there's there's smaller versions of Cas9. I think like CPF or some. There's there's different. There's smaller versions. I could I could take a look at that, which have been, um, which have I think been optimized for. Um, let me take a look. I'm just gonna do. It. I can know in vitro you can do liposome delivery, but that's even harder if we're thinking about like delivery in the body. Um, oops. Um, okay, so just pulled out a paper here from 2018. Uh, generation of the adenovirus vector mediated CRISPR CPF1. Um, an application for primary human hepatocytes prepared for immunized mice, chimeric liver. Um, CRISPR associate endonuclease in uh, CPF1. Uh, it's, yeah, so you can use that version in adenoviruses. Uh, I think it it's a lot smaller. I'm not sure how much smaller. So yeah, um, but then of course you know if you're going to be targeting multiple locations, uh, you're gonna you're gonna have to have lots of guide RNAs. So I mean guide RNAs are are, are pretty small, but you still if you're talking about hundreds of locations, you might need to use a cocktail of uh, no viruses, you know, um, and, and, and then of course they have to, they have to transfect cells multiple times. So, um, so I don't know, I don't know how many different guide RNAs along with CPF1 you can actually cram into an adenovirus yeah. vector. Um, certainly one, yes, a um, hundred, I, I don't know, right, um, 500. So, you know, um, so yeah, the delivery is, you know, delivery is still an obstacle, right? Um, and it might be okay for, for certain applications that are, you know, like, like 
uh, organs or or certain or certain you know certain issues, right? Um, but of course, you know the issue is getting into every cell everywhere. So, so here, you know the you know here using this modified system that's uh, that has a um, uh, that has this fusion protein that's basically um, you know uh, that change alters the methylation status um, one way or the other. Uh, you're not we're not worrying. It's not as complex as cutting the DNA and then trying to copy something in via homologous recombination. So you're not kind of worried about that, but you still you still have the delivery um, system that needs to be optimized. Uh, you know to to get into a metazoan into you know and, and, and into different tissues and into different different cell types um, uh, throughout throughout the body because you get what like roughly 200 some odd different cell types in the body and then 50 plus trillion cells and then you know blood brain barrier and you know etc cetera, etc cetera. and and so it's you know that's that's going to be that's going to be the issue but you know um, one thing at a time They've got this system here. They demonstrated it targets every location that's you know that they've looked at. Um, still need to figure out how much offsite targeting is is going to play a role uh, in kind of you know and sort of holding back the the technical application of the system in a clinical use. Um, but like I said, this is this is a state of the art demonstration here. Um, we don't have I don't think we have a finer tool available right now that can specifically target. Um, the methylation status of, of um, precise locations that you want at will. Um, I think this, this paper is, is kind of right at the tip of the sphere um, with this technology. I know we're um, kind of way over on time, but my one last comment is uh, figure 7A and B for me, I think was the most surprising part of the paper that was cool. Yeah. Like the rewriting epigenetics, neat, but cells rewrite their own epigenetics constantly. Um, mm -hmm. So, like, if you make a change, sure, you can show that it lasts for 30 days, but if the cell is just an HEK in a dish, sure. But um, the fact that they showed it, per, that yeah, I think 7B is the figure that shows mm -hmm. their change persisting past their neural differentiation. Mm -hmm. I didn't think that would ever work. Um, right, I would have, right, right. I would have rewritten itself. And um, the fact that, it, that their modification persisted past differentiation, I think was unexpected and makes this a lot more interesting um, since like stem cells are probably the sorts of cells that are most relevant to aging relevant therapies. Um, and yeah. your therapy doesn't just explode once the cell differentiates. Um, yeah. That's to me weird and kind of awesome. That, that is, yes, uh, uh, good thing you pointed that out. Yes, that is, that is one uh, one very important thing to know, uh, but um, but there is a, that they did choose this region. They did choose, I think, is um, is uh, correct me if I'm wrong. They probably ch chose this region because it's probably you know one of the regions that's not being affected right during during reprogramming of the IPSC to the neuron. Yeah, I don't know what TD81 does. Yeah. Um, but it is interesting in, 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 in the respect that it is an artificially, um, it's an artificially uh, methylated location by the system and the neuronal reprogramming kind of doesn't recognize it as, as something to be touched, right? So, so this whole, like you said, any, any kind of, you know, the reprogramming from, a, from one cell to another is, is pretty extensive. Uh, same thing with like aging, but the cell has an ability, it's not willy nilly and the cell has an ability to recognize that whatever their system did to CD81 shouldn't be touched. Or like that's, that's not neuronal specific. We're not, not and, and I don't know if that, um, just trying to think if there's something profound to be said there. Um, it, like you said, it is pretty, you know, it is startling that, that it, it persisted, right? Going through this, through the whole IPSC to neuron and, and neuronal change in this, this location, CD81, you should take a look at that a little bit more carefully, you know, still persisted after the cells have changed into neurons. Um, I'm just thinking if there's something else that more profound can be said other than, um, you know, just, um, I'm thinking out loud here. Um, 
I mean, in one thing that I think is kind of interesting is that so they their modifications are kind of weird. They're not they're not traditionally regulated. Like you were describing one of the big findings of this paper has had these non canonical modifications. Yeah. And um, in Figure Seven, they're not looking at that. They're not just doing bisulfite. Yeah. They're actually looking at a silencing, which is like this the methylation that matters. Um, so they actually met a higher bar than they had to. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I'm just trying to think here. Um, so if, if, so, I mean, the, so the neuron, yeah. So yeah, if, 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 if the reprogramming is happening in neuron, it's, it's not just looking at uh, methylation per se, but it's also looking at the positioning of the methylation. Let me just put it, yeah, like a little bit more crudely. Assuming that, assuming that the way that the methylation looks, let's say at a much more finer scale, you know, let's, um, you know, this might be a wrong assumption to make, but let's say the methylation at CD81 looks the same as a methylation at, you know, that's normally methylated, right? Let's then, 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 then what the neuron is, you know, what the anthropomorphize a bit what the what the proteins and the neurons are looking for inside of themselves are not just the methylation status per se but also you know something else other variables one of them the obvious one being location as to you know maybe maybe it's maybe it's pushed into a certain you know domain region i'm not sure uh, of the chromatin but there's there's clearly other other things that are um, uh, other markers that are being looked at, um, and it'd be interesting to maybe see. I'm just thinking out loud here again. If you could do like a screen and see, well, let's say let's change the methylation status of a whole bunch of places in the neuron, and then see if they're conserved or not after or in iPSC cells and see if they're conserved or not if they go through differentiation to a neuron. And if, if they are, you know, conserve, you know, if the, the, if the status doesn't change, what's the difference between that location and the other location, right? I mean, because they're both methylated, but there must be another key difference, um, you know, key difference spatially that, that is, is, is somehow, or maybe there's some other chemical signifiers that are saying, this methylation has to has to change, but not that one, right? I'm not I'm not sure. Um, so yeah, that's that's you know that could be something. That could be something uh, something there, profound as far as a, a another type of very basic science screen that could be done um, to, to to figure out how exactly you know what what cues the cells are looking for to you know, to precisely reprogram themselves and, you know, not touch other areas that are also reprogrammed, right, or synthetically reprogrammed. So somehow, you know, like you pointed out, somehow the, the cell knows that this artificially pro reprogrammed site is, is, should be left alone. Um, why? I'm not sure. So, yeah. So very cool. Um, very, very cool application of technology. Um, a lot of labs involved, a lot of, uh, a lot of researchers on this paper. Um, and, um, you know, uh, I'm sure, I'm sure that the aging community right now, people are, are looking at this paper as well and already, already designing experiments. It should be, <laughs> um, you know, you know, it, uh, there, there's at least, at least in, you know, at least in, in tissue culture, right? So you've got a CRISPR system that's easy to manipulate, transfector cells target a whole bunch of locations that are, that are, that are known to be regulated, um, that are known to change in aging and see if the phenotypes basically, basically, um, you know, you can change change the phenotypes um, as, as, as a consequence of using this technology. That's, that's sort of, the, that's sort of the, the most obvious basic experiment. And certainly you can, you can get more complex than that. You can, you can then in, infuse uh, mice with uh, adenoviruses and, and modified um, CPF1. Um, that's going to be much more complex because now you're dealing with a different test protein. So you'd have to make new fusion proteins and test their, test their you know, efficacy and see how, how well they perform. So 
um, you know, a lot of, lot of work involved, obviously. You can't, you know, nobody's gonna just jump in and I wouldn't expect a, an aging paper piggybacking off of this next week unless, you know, unless people have been working side by side all along throughout this paper, as, you know, but so it's, it's gonna take some time. Of course they have. It's all, it's all a secret. It's all going on at Calico. But um, yeah, <laughs> one of the things that you could try is telomerase activation, our old friend with the telomeres which somebody on Facebook, Frankie TF says, would life extension uh, revolve around exaggerating the life of telomeres? In other words, lengthening telomeres possibly would have some uh, genomic stability effect. Yeah, yeah. So, so regulation of, yeah. So turning, using this system to turn on, you know, switch on telomerase. Um, so there's so, um, um, and, and uh, and the and ch checking changing the epigenetic status of a variety of genes and you know looking at looking at other um, uh, epigenetic modifiers like you know uh, histone deacetylases right so so looking at being able to modify the acetylation status which which also changes um, so there's there's lots of there's lots of derivatives that can come out of this paper. Um, and I think there's, there's, a, you know, there's a whole slew of experiments that can be done within the aging field um, based on the technological platform that's, um, you know, highlighted in this paper. So, um, so I expect, I expect to see papers, you know, we'll, we'll see papers coming out in the aging field in the next couple of years um, using, using aspects of this. The elephant in the room here, of course, is it could finally help settle the age-old argument. And it is an argument. It's not a debate. It's an argument between the two camps. Whereas upon yeah. one camp, I'm saying no names, says epigenetic alterations are a driver of aging. Hallmark. <laughs> and another one, another camp, who maybe uh, sends, says that epigenetic changes are a consequence of other damages. So honestly, I think this could help settle that matter once and for all. Yeah, in, in, in bits and pieces, certainly. You can certainly start, you could certainly start, you know, this, this start uh, designing experiments where, where you change the epigenetic status, like I said, and see if there's a reversal uh, in, in certain, um, you know, uh, improve the functionality of, of cells, physiology, um, and, 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 you know, that will, or not, right? If, if, if the status changes and the cell is still crappy, then okay, then, then you've got, you've got evidence in one direction, you know, and, or, or, or it does, and then you've got evidence mm -hmm. in the other direction. So like you said, Steve, it's, uh, that, uh, I'm sure people are going to be designing experiments um, to, to help settle that. As well, it would sure be nice if it was the case that uh, methylation and, and epigenetic changes in general were not just the hands of the clock, but were actually part of the clock itself. That would actually make aging a little bit simpler to solve, um, to be honest. I mean, I know I've spoken to Aubrey about it, and he said, Oh, it'd be great if it worked like that. So he's not opposed to the idea, he just doesn't, he just doesn't think it works like that. So yeah. The great thing is, I think all ideas are valid, and that's the whole point about what we do as a field. And I think we're going to get some answers. You know, things like this help advance the science and get those answers. But it, it'd be great if uh, if it worked like that. And and you know, things like IPSCs, the experiments that um, uh, Ocampo and Belmonte did, and others have replicated where they've reset the, um, the, you know, the in living animals, they've reset the uh, epigenetic mm -hmm. status. It does seem to spur rejuvenation. Mm -hmm. And I mentioned convoys in the chat earlier. Again, that seems to, at least in some way, reprogram epigenetic mm -hmm. states of cells. So if I was going to say which camp I'm in, I'm going to sort of say that I'm in the, I think epigenetics is a cause not a consequence although i don't mean just you know obviously sometimes it's a consequence because you've got things like random epigenetic drift but 
I still think there's a very good case to be said that there's a very tightly controlled process going on here in some ways. So mm -hmm. that's my 2P. I think it's probably a cause. There you go. I've committed myself now. Mm -hmm. I owe Aubrey a beer if I'm wrong. Okay. Fair enough. All right. Do we have any more questions about uh, this, uh, this novel fusion protein uh, based on the Cas9 technological platform that's been sweeping the scientific world by storm since 2012? Right, so God, it's been what nine years now. It's almost ten years. So God, it's gone by so fast. <clears throat> yes, and uh, it quite rightly got some people Nobel prizes as well, Nobel yeah. prizes. Yeah. The only thing, yeah, I don't know, I'm going to stick my foot out here. The only, the only thing I'm a, I'm a little, little surprised at is that Nobel prizes can be given to three people, right? Up to three people for share one Nobel prize, um, and they've given it to. Um, Carpentier and Doudna, who no doubt deserve it. Um, they, you know, they, they really, they really developed the technology to a platform that people use. Um, well, I'm just surprised that at least one of the researchers from the past who discovered CRISPR-Cas9 and said, hey, like Bohika or, or any of the others who basically said, hey, look, this is a this is a, a acquired immune system in bacteria that recognizes DNA and cuts it and uses RNA and it's a nuclear protein. And everybody said, what? Oh, let's use this as a technological platform. I'm surprised that nobody from that basic research camp shared in the Nobel Prize. That's, that's all I'm going to say. Yeah, that is weird since they can do three, but they chose not to. Yeah, so, so I, was a little, I was a little surprised because it's like nobody would have you know, nobody would have uh, developed Cas9 CRISPR if it wasn't discovered. <laughs> and, 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 the, and the people, none of the people who actually discovered CRISPR Cas9 shared in the Nobel Prize, which is a bit surprising actually to me. But anyway, I wasn't on that committee. I don't know how that goes. Just, you know, whatever. Um, that's just my two cents. Um, yeah, let's uh, not dig, uh, let's sir, not dig sir, ourselves sir. further. No, no, I'm, I'm saying Dowden and Carpentier definitely deserve it, but I'm just saying that there was still one more slot available and, and, and we could have gone to somebody who, who, who contributed to the initial early discovery of, of the of the Cas9 system. Wouldn't be George, would it? By any chance, George something? George. Are you thinking of George or? Uh, well, I'm th I was thinking of as as one of as one of uh, I, I don't know what his first name is. Um, there's a couple of other researchers like like back in back in the early 2000s where 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 they was actually um, or was actually hypothesized that this was um, because the, I think the discovery of the sequences and head scratching happened in the late 80s early 90s I think a Japanese team right. and they basically they, they found the sequences and they were like what, what are these repetitive sequences that keep popping up in bacteria all over the world we don't know what they are but they're there and 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 it's and it's I think they encode phage bacteria uh, phage sequences so nobody knew what what to make of it and then a couple of scientists later down the road in the early 2000s, Bokika and, and some others basically said, uh, you know what, I think it's an acquired bacterial immune system and this is how it probably operates. And, uh, and then everybody was like, what? Um, that's really cool. Uh, let's make a technological platform out of it, right? Because, um, you know, because going back to PCR, right? You can't have PCR unless somebody discovered the DNA polymerase, right? And of course, I think it was Kornberg, right? Who got the Nobel Prize for that for DNA polymerases? So, so you had to do, you know, so you had to discover DNA polymerase before you had PCR. So it would be kind of weird not to have given Kornberg or any of the other scientists a Nobel Prize for discovering the enzyme that led to PCR and then just given the award for PCR, right? It's sort of like anyway, whatever. That's that's my my speculation but uh it's a powerful technological platform and um and here we see its power being uh unleashed on the epigenome and um <clears throat> we'll no doubt see it being applied to us yeah although i wouldn't hold your breath just yet i think we're i think i think we're still 
I've said it before, I think we're at least 10, 15 years away before it even gets near humans. Um, you know. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not talking about humans, I'm talking about mouse. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, we're getting closer, aren't we? We're doing it in living animals. But, you know, quite rightly, we've got to be very, very cautious about, you know, fiddling with the epigenetics. But I think we'll get there. But I think it's one of the more exciting technologies. But it's going to be 10, 15 years before I think it it gets in the clinic. Yeah, I mean, like 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 you said, I mean, you 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 you, you want to change the epigenome, but it's it's not something to be um casually tinkered with because you don't you don't want your you don't want your cells uh converting into the wrong cell type or or you know turning into cells that are completely undifferentiated right so i mean it's um it's uh more research needs to be done it's a very very powerful tool though um mm -hmm. but for that reason you, you, you know it's 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 uh it has to be carefully modulated and certainly since aging seems to affect many locations of the epigenome, um, it's got to be done very carefully because we're not just changing one gene. It's not like one drug, one gene. We're, we're changing lots of locations throughout the genome on every chromosome. So um, that's uh, that's pretty complex. Yeah, but we, I mean, obviously, tentatively, we do know that the principle sound because we've seen it demonstrated at least twice now. Yeah. in in living animals so we know that it can be done it's just a case of the timing you know between resetting the age of your cells not necessarily all of them because as you mentioned you're not going to necessarily hit all of them initially unless your delivery system's great and it, it's a toss-up between that and and turning into a, a giant ball of cancer so you've got to you've got to be uh all all your cells forget what they are which is, you know, a bit dodgy when it's a heart cell and it goes, oh, look, I've gone back to pluripotency. I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing with my life. So, you know, you don't want that either. So that, there's the extreme. But there is a sweet spot. So, and I think we're going to get better and better at perfecting that sweet spot. And at that point, that is when I think the conversation is going to start advancing towards the clinic when, when you know, where they've wrung the maximum amount of safety out of it as possible. Yeah. Yeah. And also delivery, right? So the good thing about these technologies also is they're orthologous to one another, meaning that you can optimize each of them independently of one another. So we can, so we don't have to wait for the delivery to get better in order to optimize changing the epigenome at different locations as with this technology here. So, so no doubt, you know, different ways to deliver this, you know, the, these tools into cells throughout the body, uh, that's also going to progress, um, you know, as it needs to, if, if you, if you need to efficiently get this inside of a particular cell, right, that's deep inside your body, then, then delivery systems need to be, need to be optimized as well. And, and who knows, maybe, maybe there'll be a breakthrough in that. And, uh, we'll, we'll have a journal club that talks about, um, you know, um, a breakthrough development in nano delivery to every single cell type, you know, in a metazoan very efficiently past the blood, blood brain barrier, yada, yada. And, and we will bring that paper to you because, because that, uh, even though that is not specific to aging, it certainly, you know, the technological platform will be, will be um, exploited by the um, longevity and aging research community. And anyway, the BBB is not that much of a barrier anyway, because if we can't get it through the BBB for your bloodstream, we'll just inject you in the brain. That's true. The nose is an option. Straight up the nose. Sorry about that if you're eating your dinner at home at the moment, folks. So, conclusion. We liked it. We thought it was a good paper. Yes. Nine out of ten would read it again. Yes. There you go. You've had it from the uh, CRISPR expert there. Yes. So we'll, uh, we like that I, sort of thing. Yep. So, so great job for everybody on this paper. And uh, hmm. sorry, I couldn't get through every single figure here, but I think we, we've covered enough that, you know, if anybody wants to read the paper and, you know, use it for their own research applications, uh, certainly do that. Go ahead. Uh, it's, it's very worth, well worthwhile. Um, and, uh, and, you know, congrats to the researchers who did all the 
all the hard work in this paper because it's a, it's it's research is hard. It's a lot of lot of lot of grunt work in a laboratory. So it's not like you know you can just turn these out. So there we go. And now my thoughts turn to next time, where we may may possibly have a guest. Mm -hmm. I don't think we should show our hand just yet, yet, though. Not yet, not yet. He, We're going to keep teasing. He said yes, but we'll we'll uh, we'll, we'll we'll double check, to make sure that that yes is a firm yes. Yes. Yeah, so sometimes the yeses from researchers isn't always a yes. So, you know, that's the way that's the way they roll. So uh, we'll just we'll just see uh, what's what's what next time. But hopefully, if all goes well, we should have a guest joining us and a pretty related paper i would say really yes, yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah and i'm not saying any more guys because spoilers yeah. so oliver i want you to land i want you to land our special guest okay notice i didn't even mention whether they were male or female no clues um <laughs> oh no you did though oh you blew it yeah but you know you made it 50 percent easier but these days, you know, uh, their gender might change between now and then, so we don't. You know. Only if something's gone <laughs> well, either very, very wrong. right or no. very wrong. I don't know. <laughs> Depending on what your aim is. Anyway, and on that, and it might no. not be the primary researcher. It might be somebody else with a different gender on the paper. So who knows? Oh yeah, that's true. We still don't know. We still don't know. Yeah, that could be. Well. We'll let you know via the usual channels. Obviously, we'll uh, email everybody out uh, uh, who's a lifespan hero to let you know what it is and when it is and where it is. Or you can also check the website if you if you do and log in. You'll see that there's a there's now a heroes corner. We always put the call details up there too, so there's no excuse for you not turning up at all. So we'll be taking names. And I guess if you'd like to join us uh, as well and you're interested in supporting shows like this and all the other crazy stuff that we get up to, um, you might consider becoming a Lifespan hero and supporting us every month. You can find out more about that at lifespan.io forward slash heroes. And that's it, I guess. We'll, uh, we'll probably, uh, with a bit of luck and a fair win, we'll see you, uh, we'll see you next uh, month yep. around about the same time. Yes, indeed. So thanks for everyone who's joined us and catch you later. Adios.